Musik, die man überlisten kann, ist so toll. Ne? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are, we are complete and uh, should begin. So welcome everyone to uh, uh, this lecture this afternoon um, from the Collaborative Research Center, Future Rural Africa. And I'm glad to um, welcome and introduce to you uh, Karis Enns, who has just arrived from Canada. That's why we opened the windows for you, so that you don't have this climate shock when you see how warm it is in Bonn. You, how, how high was the snow when you left Canada? It's a couple of feet. A couple of feet, yeah, okay, good. So we will never get that far here in Bonn, uh, and with climate change even less so after the talk we have just had um, by uh, Ezekiel. Well, just a very few words. Um, to introduce uh, our speaker and then I leave the floor to you. Um, Karis Enns is a lecturer in international development at the um, Institute for uh, Development Studies uh, in Sheffield, um, but she's on the leave or, or about to leave in a few months from Sheffield to Manchester, uh, again uh, to join the Institute of Development Studies in Manchester um, with her background in human geography as I, as I understand your uh, Vita. Uh, and uh, the reason why we invited you is that uh, we share a lot of um, scientific interests and also research experiences and regional experiences since uh, Karis Enns has done extensive research on um, various types of uh, change and development in Africa, especially in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa, as I understand. One uh, research interest uh, you have is on um, as you put it on your website, on the on the interface between human geography, um, social and ecological transformation, and uh, large-scale concepts of infrastructure construction and development corridors, and that that is one of the um, projects you have just um, um, completed a few months ago. I don't know whether it, whether it's still going on. Um, a project you were talking about at a conference, the ECAS conference in. Edinburgh, where I know also some of us have been a few months ago, and um, where we realized that it would be interesting to get into a conversation about what you have done in uh, your study areas and what we are just beginning to research in our um, study areas in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. Well, uh, another um, field of interest is about uh, the impact of resource extraction on rural livelihoods and livelihood systems, which you have researched in Eastern Africa and Central Africa. That was another project at Paria uh, with a focus on mining activities. Some people in this room are interested in mining and energy production, in, especially in uh, Kenya. And then you did research on changing landscapes of biodiversity conservation in Kenya. There's a few people here who are interested in conservation activities both in Kenya, Tanzania and in Namibia and the Kaza area. And then um, this big project um, about uh, resource corridors and infrastructure-led development about which you are going to talk today. So, Karis, I'm glad you're here um, and um, you will have as much time as you need. Um, if it's not more than 60 minutes uh, or let's say 70 minutes, then we'll have about 45 minutes for a discussion. Afterwards, you're all invited to grab a beer and, and a brezel outside. Um, and then um, after 30, 40 minutes or so, uh, the ones who would like to join us uh, can just join us uh, to have dinner together at Havana restaurant on the other side of the street. So Karis, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm really pleased to be here today. I've been looking forward to this visit. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, so I won't do any further introductions. I've, that's been covered, as was said. I, my name's Karis Enns. Um, my plan is to speak for about 45 minutes, probably, and then leave lots of time for question and discussion. What I'm talking about today is something I hope some of these ideas will form the basis of a book project over the coming years, but these ideas are in the very early stages of development. So I really look forward to your questions and comments 
after I finish speaking. I think this is kind of the best time to get feedback. It's a scary time to get feedback because I'm really early in working through these uh, ideas, but it's also the best time to kind of incorporate other people's suggestions. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. And most specifically, I'm going to be talking about um, case study of northern Kenya, but I'm really interested in hearing how some of the ideas and concepts I'm talking about today might apply to your own research sites and case studies beyond, beyond um, the northern Kenyan case. I'll make two quick notes before beginning. Um, the first is that I sent the abstract a couple a couple months ago now, and so some of my ideas have evolved a little bit. I hope you don't mind if I move in slightly different directions and cover a little bit of a longer temporal period than I originally suggested. And then the second thing is that the research I'm presenting today has all been done in collaboration with Brock Berseglio at the University of Birmingham and Ramson Karmushu, who's um, a researcher at a civil society organization in northern Kenya. So speaking about ideas that have come out of our conversations together over time. So across much of the Global South, national spatial planning has re-emerged as a key component of national development in recent years. And this renaissance of national spatial planning can be seen all over the world, but in East Africa in particular. And it's conveyed through documents like Kenya's National Spatial Plan, Uganda's National Physical Development Plan, and Tanzania's Indust Integrated Industrial Strategy. The stated intentions of spatial development plans are to support sustainable development while also enhancing global competitiveness. And this is done by doing three things. Across these spatial plans, we see the th these three key characteristics. One, balancing regional development and regional disparities. Two, making use of lands that have been underexploited in the past. And three, establishing integrated infrastructure networks to plug in different regions of the country and underexploited lands into global value chains. In this talk, I'm going to suggest that contemporary national spatial plans are informed by ambitions of the colonial past, as well as anxieties about an increasingly uncertain future, largely as a result of climate change. And as a result, <coughs> at least in the Kenyan context, the National Spatial Plan lacks attentiveness to people's needs and aspirations and development desires today because of this focus on the colonial past and this uncertain future. To make this point, I'll be using the case study of uh, national spatial planning and its implementation in northern Kenya. I'll begin by briefly situating this talk in a larger debate about the return of national spatial planning. I'll then move on <coughs> to focus on the northern Kenyan context, talking a little bit about national spatial planning in Kenya and how it's being implemented in northern Kenya. And I'll finish by zooming back out to talk about what this means for rural futures in the Kenyan context and also to raise some questions about what this might mean for rural futures elsewhere and kind of the applicability of some of the ideas I'm raising here beyond the Kenyan case. So we are currently witnessing the re-emergence of na national spatial planning across the global south. And national spatial planning has been actively promoted by major development organizations like the World Bank and UN Habitat. These organizations have framed national spatial planning as a solution to many of the development challenges that we currently face. National governments have readily bought into this and so have private actors as well as different types of development actors as national spatial planning really offering something new, a new approach to doing development. From Southeast Asia to South Africa, uh, America to Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a growing consensus around the importance of national spatial planning and more and more guidance is emerging to help countries devise their national spatial plans and then integrate their national spatial plans. As my colleagues Seth Schindler and Miguel Kanai have recently argued, the goal of contemporary national spatial planning is to produce territories that can be easily plugged in to global value chains. National spatial plans aim to get the territory right in order to attract foreign investment, foster industrial upgrading and export oriented growth. With this goal in mind of getting the territory right, national spatial plans are designed to integrate resource frontiers and industrial hubs into the global economy via large scale transboundary infrastructure projects. And these national spatial plans are brought to fruition through innovative funding arrangements between different actors, public and private, and key actors include those like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the China Development Bank. 
And that image, I don't know if you can see it well, but it comes from Africa oil, but it's a really good representation of what national spatial planning is all about. It's about connecting the resource frontier and the industrial hub via large-scale infrastructure to the port. And it erases everything that kind of lies in between. It's all about the connection to global markets and all of the intricacies of what la lies in this space in between, the everyday, is kind of erased in these types of images that are conveyed through national spatial planning documents. Notably, an emphasis on national spatial planning is not entirely new. Rather, there was a strong consensus around national spatial planning in the immediate post-independent era. And this consensus around national spatial planning was a focus on addressing regional disparities that had been produced through colonial administrations, often in order to enforce segregation. So immediately <laughs> in the post-independence era, you'll see in um, national documents a focus on addressing rural urban disparities, on getting rid of indigenous reserves in the Kenyan context. So there was a focus nationally on balancing development spatially. However, during the neoliberal era, this focus fell to the wayside. There was the state withdrew, there was a focus on decentralization, and uh, Schindler and Kanai argue the focus became, instead of getting the territory right during this period, getting the institution right, getting governance right, and then getting the market right. And everyone stopped thinking about the organization of space. However, recently this focus has re-emerged with thinking about the organization of space and connecting space to global markets as being a key way of driving development. And what sets apart the national spatial planning of today from the national spatial planning of the past is that rather than focusing on just incorporating national space through integrated infrastructure networks, there's a focus on incorporating national space into global space. So addressing regional disparities and then plugging these regional disparities into global networks via infrastructure investments. So now turning to the Kenyan context. Kenya's National Spatial Plan provides a framework for guiding Kenya's territorial design and plans for land use over a 30-year period. The plan suggests in its opening that land is a limited resource which has not always been optimally, optimally used throughout Kenya's history. In response, the plan provides strategies and policies to facilitate sustainable exploitation of the huge uh, potential that the country possesses, specifically in agriculture, tourism, energy, water, fishing and forestry. It also provides strategies and policies for addressing regional disparities that have resulted in the the underutilization of land in certain areas. Furthermore, the plan outlines how all regions of the country will be integrated into regional, national, and then supranational um, value chains, fostering and facilitating economic linkages with neighboring countries, for example, through the EAC and COMESA, and then globally. So in summary, Kenya's National Spatial Plan really embodies these three char key characteristics that we see in National Spatial Plans. That's making use of land that hasn't been made use of in the past, addressing regional disparities, and then plugging all of this land into global networks. Right now on the screen, you can see the conceptual framework from Kenya's National Spatial Plan. So this plan's conveyed in a 272-page document, but they regularly reference <coughs> back to this key conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework shows where lands are that have potential, what type of potential these lands have, the different colors represent the different potential of the land, and then how these lands will be plugged into regional, national, and global value chains through new investments in infrastructure. This vision or ambition <coughs> of identifying underexploited lands and then integrating them into global value chains really relies on making use of lands in northern Kenya and addressing the regional disparity or un uh, lack of attention given to northern Kenya in the past. Northern Kenya is generally used to refer to, to Kenya's arid and semi-arid lands or asals. So it's about 80% of the country and it's basically all of the country from the kind of yellow and green spot upwards. The South have the lowest development indicators and the high incidence, highest incidences of poverty in the country. And this is partly because of conscious policy decisions in the past to direct resources towards so-called high potential agricultural areas rather than arid districts, which were home to livestock-based economies. 
There's this really interesting line in the preface of the National Spatial Plan that says that strategies and policies promoted by the plan are expected to reduce regional inequalities that have existed by ensuring that these regions are no longer perceived as low potential, but as differently endowed. <laughs> so this represents the shift of seeing lands of low potential reorganizing space so they can become full of potential because they are endowed in some way to contribute to the global economy. Later in the plan, it's explained that a recent assessment of arid and semi-arid lands in northern Kenya have found that areas that were previously perceived as low potential have abundant natural resources, including wildlife, mineral deposits, green energy resources, underground and surface water, and yet all these resources are, are not yet exploited optimally. So with these underexploited resources in mind, the goal then becomes figuring out how to get the territory right, namely how to integrate these newly identified resource frontiers into the global economy. And the images on this slide come from a PowerPoint presentation where a government official was presenting on the National Spatial Plan and it provides a really good visual of how these underexploited arid and semi-arid lands, how they'll be reorganized using spatial planning through coordinated investments which zone land for certain types of use and the end result are those two bottom pictures of what they've called spatial prosperity. So through spatial planning these underexploited lands will result in spatial prosperity. So a key way that this is being achieved in northern Kenya is through the Lamu Port South Sudan Transport Corridor or LAPSET. LAPSET is the lever or mechanism through which territory is being plugged into value chains in northern Kenya. So I have a short video clip here <laughs> which shows what LAPSET is all about. Um, let's see if it plays I'll just talk through and describe what's happening. <laughs> Oh, you, somebody now I'm going to be competing with her. But so LAPSET is this multimodal infrastructure corridor that's going to plug in these three different countries into global value chains. And the idea is that the corridor will eventually connect Central Africa and all the way to West Africa, creating this land bridge. And this is being achieved through different investments in infrastructure starting in Kenya and then working outwards. I know many of you are familiar with LAPSET, but just in case anyone isn't, I'll go through this still. So these are the parts that are currently completed and now it's going on to show the, the next stages. They're starting with the highway investment, so high speed highway to connect the northern parts of the country to South Sudan and Ethiopia. This will be followed by investments in a pipeline um, that will parallel the highway and that will reach the port and the port investments are almost complete. LAPSET, they say, will create job opportunities and stimulate enterprise. Um, it will, I don't have the view memorized, so I don't know exactly what they're saying at this point. There we go. Um, there's these five key zoning areas, or six key zoning areas along the corridor in transport, resort cities, special economic zones, industrial parks, mineral exploration, and free trade. And it's an investor's dream. So this is the primary way in which national spatial planning is being enacted in northern Kenya is through LAPSET. So LAPSET becomes the mechanism or lever through which spatial planning becomes a reality. So returning to this idea of what national spatial planning is all about, if national spatial planning is about integrating resource frontiers and industrial hubs through investments in infrastructure to the global economy, LAPSET does this all at once. It does this first through the investments in infrastructure. So the trunk infrastructure investments include networks of highways, railway lines, oil pipelines, electrical power lines, and fiber optic cables, all of which enable the newly discovered resource frontiers and planned industrial zones to be integrated into the economy. Once completed, LAPSET will connect nine counties across northern Kenya, as well as South Sudan and Ethiopia, to global markets. And the government claims this won't just be good for the economy, but it will also help to overcome regional disparities, balancing socioeconomic marginalization, and position northern Kenya as Africa's new logistics hub. At the same time, though, LAPSET involves zoning for other types of land use. So there's actually the creation of resource frontiers and industrial hubs through the implementation of LAPSET.
The corridor is overlaid by a 50 kilometer wide economic corridor. The video kind of talks through this and different land uses are zoned for different parts of this corridor. Some land within the economic corridor has been zoned for industrial development with an emphasis around modernizing the livestock sector. For example, around 60,000 hectares have been earmarked for livestock pr production and processing in Isiolo in north central Kenya. Once complete, these will include a large quarantine area, a modern abattoir, and there's also talk about starting a tanning, uh, tanning industry. The livestock production and processing zone is being built in accordance with international export regulations so that livestock can be exported largely to the Middle Eastern markets. Other areas of land within the corridor are zoned for touristic development, and that's represented by little palm trees on that map. The tourist zones are planned for, each tourist zone will host a resort city and they'll form part of a, a northern Kenya tourist circuit where tourists can travel easily between these different tourist zones in order to see world-renowned sites, heritage sites and rich biodiversity. Each of the resort cities has links with protected areas, both national parks and private conservancies. So when the tourists arrive in these resort cities, they'll then be shuttled off to surrounding conservation areas, which is said to grow the economy, the tourist economy, and attract people and new business ventures into the area. Land within the economic corridor has also been zoned for various types of natural resource development. Sorry. Um, and mineral exploration. So this includes um, obviously oil, the oil, disc, um, oil development as well as, sorry, I've lost my mouse here, um, as well as uh, mining licenses. So there's been a lot of news recently in Northern Kenya about um, in the kind of local media about a growing um, frankincense and myrrh operation and mining in the region. And then the final land use planned or zoned for northern Kenya is this growth of urban centers. So a number of cities or zones along the corridor have been planned for urban growth and development. And this is another type of zoning that's taking place. So, Kenya's National Spatial Plan and the implementation of this plan through LAPSET has reimagined and reframed Northern Kenya as an untapped resource frontier that can be exploited for the good of the country through the reorganization of national space. LAPSET serves as the mechanism through which this reorganization of space is being made possible. This reimagining of Northern Kenya has led some to suggest that we are witnessing a true departure from Kenya's earlier approaches to development. For example, Mosley and Watson have argued Kenya's northern frontier regions were formerly seen as unproductive and of little interest, whereas now they're seen as an unexploited resource that can provide the engine of growth for the wider national economy. However, what I'll now suggest is that while it's true that northern Kenya is being incorporated into the state in ways that it wasn't before, not everything about this reimagining of northern Kenya is new. In fact, historicizing contemporary spatial planning and plans for Northern Kenya reveals how colonial ideas about Northern Kenya and how it can be made competitive, how space could be useful for global markets are actually <coughs> being reproduced through the implementation of Kenya's national plans. And this is something that I've written about recently with Brock Berseglio and Antipo, but I'll summarize some of our main points here. So it's very much true that in the, under the colonial administration, northern Kenya was often spoken about as if it was a wasteland. In early colonial and post or early independence writing, you see this type of language, northern Kenya or the northern frontier district being talked about as a wasteland. Both the colonial administration and the post-colonial administration would refer to northern Kenya as nothing but a buffer zone, a buffer zone that would protect the settled white highlands from the hostile neighbors to the north and the east. Yeah, if one's to look closely at documents from this period of time, there's also evidence that these same administrators did see potential in northern Kenya. And this, this potential that they identified, the ways that they identified land could be used, land could be rezoned, and space could be reorganized, are reflected in the spatial plans for northern Kenya today. So the first kind of reflection or repetition we see is this imperative of enhancing transnational connectivity through northern Kenya in order to secure its unexploited potential. This same imperative that we see in National Spatial Plans for Kenya today appears in colonial writing. 
While in the very early years of colonial rule, nor the Northern Frontier District was restricted, so movement within and outside of the Frontier District was completely restricted, in, two th uh, in 1911, there was this new idea about adopting a more vigorous policy of administration of the North. And this more vigorous policy of administration involved um, integrating, better integrating um, Northern Kenya into the East African Protectorate for both economic and political purposes. The colonial administration proposed that they needed to build transport that would allow Abyssinia to be connected to Kenya and that would pass through Meru, Marsabit and Mwale uh, using wheeled transport. And the importance of improving this transport was reiterated in annual reports for almost a decade. By the 1950s, when the colonial administration was talking about linking the railway up, um, up to Lakipia, up to the highlands. They also talked about the potential of even linking the railway all the way up to Abyssinia. So this is a plan that's coming to fruition today or the proposals are bringing it, making it a reality, but it actually has roots back in the 19, uh, 1920s. References to improving transport infrastructure in the Northern Frontier District were linked to similar desires or similar ideas about economic potential as we see today. So one was <laughs> this idea of growing the cross-border livestock trade. In a lot of the early colonial reports, especially those written by Jeffrey Archer, who was a colonial administrator posted in the Northern Frontier District, there's talk about opening up the region, improving transport links in order to grow the transborder and international livestock market as a way of um, building the Kenyan economy. Another motivation for improving transport infrastructure at the time was growing uh, opportunities, economic opportunities for wildlife tourism. So the colonial administrations at the time initially thought that they would be able to attract both European and North American hunters to come to the Northern Reserve, which was around Marsabit National Park at the time. And later when hunting, while game hunting became more contentious, Marsabit was promoted for its photographic safaris instead. And so there's in these early colonial reports, there's discussion about how if transport is improved, if transport links are made better, tourists will be drawn and this will be a way to help build the economy as well. Another similarity between spatial plans for Northern Kenya under the colonial administration and spatial plans today relates to urban growth and urbanization. <coughs> under the colonial administration, there were measures taken to sedentarize pastoralists in certain towns along main trade routes. The colonial administration also provided incentives for traders of Arab and Indian descent to settle in key centers along this trade route as they thought that this would attract pastoralists to settle and create wage labor opportunities. Many of these settlement centers under the colonial administration grew further during the process of forced uh, villagization after Kenya's independence. And now today in Kenya's national spatial plans, these exact same centers have been redesignated as urban growth zones. So while colonial and post-colonial government policies certainly concentrated development within the so-called um, high potential areas of the country resulting in regional imbalances and resulting in the marginalization of northern Kenya as well, they also saw certain types of potential in the north. They just didn't have the means and the finances to bring these potential to fruition at the time. Specifically, they envisioned fostering national development through the region by investing in infrastructure that would in turn attract tourism, grow the livestock trade and attract people to settle in urban centers along main transport routes. All of these ambitions are mirrored in national spatial plans for northern Kenya today and are embedded in the design of Lapset. This shows how spatial plans and visions of early administrations come to be built into contemporary national spatial plans. And in our article in Antipode, we argue that reflecting on this long-term history of national spatial plans is really important because it can reveal how contemporary documents and discourses carry with them exploitative um, interests of the past or continue to serve extractive and exploitative economies. In other words, being attentive to the enduring colonial legacy of spatial plans can help to avoid replicating spatial 
social strategies that have already proven not to work for the majority. And a really good example of this is high-end tourism. In northern Kenya, if you have over a century of attempts to build the high-end tourism sector, we can see from the past that this, this sector requires large amounts of space to be delegated for its use. It employs very few people and it tends to be, it's prone to elite capture and also uh, racial racial capture by white settlers still to this day. So when we look at the National Spatial Plan for today and see the prop, prop, propping up of high-end elite tourism as an ideal spatial use for northern Kenya, and then you trace that to the past and see how it hasn't contributed to structural transformation in the past, this allows you to raise questions or critiques about whether spatial planning for today is actually going to drive positive transformation. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna kind of di <laughs> diverge from what I wrote in the abstract. At the same time, not everything about the way that Northern Kenya is being reimagined and reframed through the National Spatial Plan has colonial roots. There are certain ways where the spatial plans for Northern Kenya depart quite significantly from the past. The two differences that I'm going to discuss today are the reimagining of Kenya as an Northern Kenya as an energy frontier and as a green frontier as a way of dealing with an increasingly uncertain future. Previously, administrations were certainly aware that northern Kenya had unexploited mineral and oil potential. The uh, archives from the 1920s and 1930s regularly reference Kenya's oil potential. However, it's only in the last few years that northern Kenya has really come to be seen as the the country's um, energy frontier, but also the entire region's energy frontier. This is partly because of the discovery of oil in northern Kenya in 2012. Since this discovery, Kenya has created dozens of new oil exploration blocks which have been auctioned off and licensed. Land has also been gazetted to support and enable transportation of oil. Oil will be transported from the 433 hectare oil production and processing facility in Lamu port in northern Kenya via an 820 kilometer pipeline. So <laughs> the oil industry, <laughs> although not particularly land intensive, is causing a great degree of spatial reorganization of land in Kenya in terms of rezoning of land and thinking about who um, governs and regulates land where. However, oil isn't the only resource to be found in northern Kenya's energy frontier. Rather, the region has been found to have abundant potential for all kinds of energy production, including hydroelectric power, wind, geothermal, and solar energy. The, ration, the nation ranks ninth in the world for geothermal power generating capacity, with recent deals for geothermal exploration and development being made in Turkana and Marsabit. Northern Kenya has also been found to have extremely good annual uh, mean wind speeds, and this has been met by major investments in wind en energy, including in the Lake Turkana Wind Power Project, which many of you are probably familiar with. And <laughs> these investments in geothermal and wind power again require significant amount of land. So there's spatial reorganization going on to make this energy frontier accessible. Furthermore, Kenya receives a considerable amount of solar radiation and thus possesses ample solar power, which hasn't been exploited until very recently. But this is quickly changing. Just last year, the Kenya Investment Authority and Meru County government entered a memorandum of understanding with two leading renewable energy developers to make Kenya's Africa's first large-scale hybrid wind, solar and battery storage project, the Meru County Energy Park. This park will include 40,000 solar panels and 20 wind turbines upon completion. So again, <laughs> a good degree of land is being reorganized and space is being reorganized in order to make this energy frontier a reality. However, at the same time that Northern Kenya is being reorganized as an energy frontier, it's being reorganized as a green frontier. And to me, this is particularly interesting because at the very moment that Northern Kenya is becoming less habitable or more difficult to inhabit because of climate change, because of rising temperatures and increasing floods and more likely famines, it's also being represented or reimagined as a solution to climate change. If one's to look at the largest investments in Northern Kenya, just in terms of pure space in recent years, these are likely to be investments that are green or climate smart investments, such as investments in biodiversity conservation, drylands restoration, and carbon offsetting. 
There's a growing trend of delegating land in northern Kenya for private and community-based biodiversity conservation. And this has a really big impact on how space in the region is organized. If you're following news in northern Kenya, it's resulting in a lot of resistance at the moment because of how it's result, uh, driving the reorganization of land. Community conservancies currently cover about 42,000 square kilometers of northern Kenya, which is a very sizable amount. The expansion of both private and community conservancies has been legitimized by fear about ecological decline across the north of the country. But in the years that conservancies have really taken off, so the early 2000s, wildlife species have increased, especially endangered species such as elephant, giraffe, geranuk, lion, and cheetah. <coughs> and as these species increase, there becomes more impetus or legitimacy for further expanding the sector because these species inhabit this space now. Another way in which northern Kenya is being reframed as a green frontier is through massive drylands restoration projects. One example of this is a project by the IUCN and the GCF, the Global Climate Fund, which plans to coordinate grazing and assist with grazing land regeneration through reseeding and control of invasive species. This particular project will be implemented in two landscapes. Those are both circled, all those landscapes are circled on the screen with the goal of protecting or restoring 500,000 hectares of rangeland in a 2.5 million hectare landscape. So it's not fully closing off these lands for use, but it's completely changing how space is organized and who has access to these lands when. And then closely related to this is the expanding use of land for carbon offsetting. For example, the Northern Grasslands Project, sponsored by the Nature Conservancy, has reportedly enforced that <laughs> has reportedly enforced a shift from continuous unrestricted grazing to planned rotational grazing, so implemented new regulations around grazing in a million hectares across northern Kenya's rangelands. These new grazing practices are said to translate into healthier grass, greater root depth, and increased soil carbon. This change is monitored through satellite imagery and soil testing, and then communities are given um, carbon credits in exchange for following these grazing practices. So if the first point that I aimed to make was that spatial visions and territorial plans of colonial administrations reappear in the national spatial plans of today, the second point that I'm making is that national spatial plans are also informed by anxieties about an increasingly uncertain future as a result of climate change. A future where changes in temperature and precipitation due to climate change will increase the frequency and severity of drought and extreme weather events, undermining livelihoods, eroding assets, and contributing to new pressures on environmental resources. This uncertain future is bound to have knock-on effects on water availability, food security, and energy security. And it's this fear or uncertainty that's enabling these very large-scale investments or spatial reorganization to take place. Thus, through Kenya's national spatial plan, northern Kenya comes to be produced as a territory that be, can be plugged into all the usual and expected global value chains, oil and gas, tourism, livestock. However, it also becomes a territory that's prepared for an uncertain future, a territory that can support and drive export-oriented growth in future-oriented sectors such as renewable energy, a territory that's anticipating significant change to the global economy as a result of climate change, but is equipped to serve as a resource frontier regardless of what the future might hold. Okay. So this leads me to the final section of my talk where I'm going to kind of reflect on why any of this matters and how we might kind of zoom out out of the Kenyan context to think about its broader applicability. And this is where things will get a little bit um, less clear. So forgive me in advance for that. So it seems to me the fact that Kenya's national spatial plan is informed by ambitions of the colonial past and anxieties about an unfuture, uncertain future <coughs> means that it lacks attentiveness to people's development aspirations, needs, and desires for today. Another way that I've been thinking about this is that there's both a spatial and temporal compression taking place as a result of the national spatial plan. This Compression is spatial because as ideas about how land should be used from the past for tourism, for infrastructure, for industry come to bear, at the same time that ideas from the future about how land should be used for renewable energy, for restoring the environment, for biodiversity, there's a spatial compression and people are physically being squeezed off certain areas of desirable land within this frontier. 
However, the compression is also temporal because as ideas from the past about how development should be done, about colonial ambitions of what development and a developing economy, a good economy looks like, come to bear through the National Spatial Plan, through things like LAPSET. And at the same time, a very futuristic way of thinking about development as renewable energy, as sustainable, as um, restoring biodiversity and restoring landscapes all come and meet in one, there's a, a lack of space for people's development desires today, for what people see and want out of development today. That understanding from an everyday person about what they want out of development is being compressed by this future-oriented and past-oriented way of doing development. <laughs> And in terms of what questions this leaves us with, I don't even know if these are questions, but two things that this has led me to think about, I guess I'll say, is first of all, I wonder what space in the Kenyan context this leaves for rural labor. It seems to me that there is very, very little space left for rural labor if these national spatial plans are come, going to come to fruition. Beyond the livestock sector, the types of role for labor in kind of colonial spatial plans for northern Kenya, such as um, the tourist sector, are very low non-labor intensive industries. And this goes for the kind of futuristic industries that are being promoted through the National Spatial Plan as well. Things like solar farms and wind farms are not labor intensive industries and the people that they do require are misaligned with the type of labor that's available in northern Kenya. So while there's a lot of short-term contracts, a lot of short-term work opportunities available to people, in terms of secure opportunities for labor, for improving life chances, for plugging into global value chains, there's a misalignment between what the frontier offers and what people living in the frontier who inhabit the frontier need. And then there's a second question or second thing I've been thinking about in relation to this, and that's where is the space for rurality within this compressed spatial context? Where is the space for people that desire rural futures, that have rural world views, that want to protect rural cultures? So within the National Spatial Plan, the obvious answer for where should people go is to the urban space. And this seems to be the response or answer within Kenya's National Spatial Plan if you were to ask the plan and if it could talk to you, what about rural labor and what about rural people, it would respond, they're going to urban centers. There isn't space for rural people in the middle of wind farms. There isn't space for rural people in the middle of the conservation sector. It's not that there couldn't be. We could imagine ways of doing wind farms and solar farms and conservation that would create space for rurality, but the way in which it's currently being implemented does not create space for rural life, life livelihoods to live within these spaces. The idea that all these people are meant to move to the urban, to settle in the urban, to grow the urban center, to be the innovation and bring the, <laughs> the industry and entrepreneurship that will grow the urban growth pulls is highly problematic. Population growth in northern Kenya is generally much higher than other parts of the country and it's already quite clear that these urban centers are having a hard time absorbing people moving to them. Furthermore, there's evidence to suggest that people that move to urban centers that give up pastoralism and rurality and their way of life often end up, at least in the immediate term, worse off than if they were to not do this because casualized labor and petty trade in town does not provide a sustainable earning or livelihood in most cases. So this raises really important questions about how rural people, how rural cultures, rural world views fit into Kenya's National Spatial Plan. And I'll just finish <laughs> off by thinking about what the answer or solution or response might be to this. Um, and I think my, my response would be that we need to find a way to imagine national spatial plants that support and sustain vibrant local rural economies and socialities while still enabling export-oriented growth to exist. We can't pretend we're not in a world where export-oriented growth, where national spatial plans and connections to global value chains and integrated infrastructure networks don't matter. These things, of course, matter, and they're likely gonna happen whether we think they should or not. But in the midst of all this, I think more attention needs to be given to rurality, to rural labor, to people who desire rural lives in the midst of all of this um, development. 
And looking at spatial plans from other countries, there is some evidence that <laughs> other <laughs> countries might be doing a slightly better job at, than Kenya is currently doing around this. South Africa's National Spatial Plan is really interesting. They have a section in it where they talk about taking <laughs> underutilized commercial, agricultural, and state-owned land back from commercial enterprises from the state and giving it to new rural entrants, new rural farmers, and then implementing services, spatial planning strategies, growing um, small urban centers that can support rural economies. This is something that's absent largely absent in the, in the National Spatial Plan for Kenya. This focus on, not on National Spatial Plan for large-scale commercial enterprises, for large-scale industrial development, but for the everyday person. And South Africa seems to be thinking in their plan, at least, about how to balance this type um, of multifaceted development. Uganda's National Spatial Plan also makes reference to something along these lines with somewhat of an innovative spatial arrangement. They reference how around urban centers, land should be set aside for agricultural <coughs> uh, production within urban space so that as people move to urban centers, even if they're enrolled in insecure livelihoods, they have a fallback right within the urban space that they can continue to rely on. So formalizing spatial zoning that supports rural livelihoods admits the urban. And then the final point I'm going to make is just whose responsibility is it to think through these types of things, to think through where the rural belongs in the midst of the National Spatial Plan, whose responsibility is it to support and ensure that rural economies are sustained amidst an export oriented world. And I think it's important to look at who's financing these projects. When major infrastructure projects or Kenya's National Spatial Plan, the implementation of it, so much of the financing is coming from actors like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the China Development Bank. These actors aren't going to be interested in sustaining rural economies. They're interested in the export-oriented in nature of this National Spatial Plan. So maybe this suggests that there needs to be other actors that have the responsibility for thinking about how the rural can continue to exist amidst this space. Um, and whether that's the state or whether that's the African Development Bank, there needs to be someone balancing these interests and ensuring that as National Spatial Plans are implemented and as export-oriented economies are made a reality, the rural can continue to exist amidst it all. So I'll wrap up here. Thank you again so much for inviting me to speak and for listening to me work through some of these ideas. I'm really excited to hear your comments and feedback.